Okay. How was your studies this week? Now, last week we dealt with uh, considering yourself. This week we're dealing with considering others. Uh, this past week y'all were to, I guess, call one another, talk to each other. Uh, so how were your conversations? Did you learn anything about one another that you didn't know? Did it make you like not want to talk to that person over again? <laughs> That's good. I did hear from Yemi, and uh, well, Yemi, he said that his family was in Little Rock today. And uh, he said uh, uh, he sent his graces and that we have a good discussion today. So he did actually reach out to me this morning and let me know what was going on. So I thought that was great. Uh, so blessings on their trip. Okay, so again, as we're dealing with Paul, you've heard me say this several times. Uh, I'm trying to get us to see, you know, Paul's a human being. You know, we see him, we've heard about him and the other, the other biblical characters for so long that they're almost like superheroes, like the Incredible Hulk or Iron Man or something. No, these are regular human beings. They had regular human beings just like you and I, regular issues, regular cultures, regular belief systems, regular experiences just like you and I. So, uh, week one, we talked about considering ourselves. Um, what makes me who I am? Why is my favorite color purple? Don't know. I know a lot of people think it's because I like prints. No, I didn't pick the man's favorite color. That's weird. Uh, I like prints, I like purple. Uh, blue, blue and red goes together just so beautifully to me. Um, and just as I have to consider myself, I have to consider others. You know, what makes Stevie tick? Why is Granny? Why does she have a t-shirt that says straight out of Compton, carrying a gat? Don't know, okay? Probably means you shouldn't mess with her though, I'd say that. <laughs> as we consider others, this is the text we're gonna look at today. Uh, Philippians chapter two, love the text. Um, the, the meat of this text is actually verses one through four. Paul is encouraging the Philippians, of course. And he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete as being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, this is our key thought, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. That's un American, at least contemporary American. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Uh, there's an organization in the church, I Am Second. I'm sure y'all familiar with I Am Second. That's kind of the spirit of that. I know it's small, Nikki. Hopefully, you can see with those glasses. Um, I put so much on her that it, it kind of shrunk it. Uh, so Paul in verse number five, he, he gives this very infamous song. Uh, he says your attitude should be the same that Jesus had. We should have Jesus' attitude. He says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. He is God in the flesh. But rather than walking around as if he was God in the flesh, he lowered himself taking the very nature of a servant, being made in a human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death on a cross, which is absolutely, positively, the worst way you could die, okay? Uh, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Let's look at this. Uh, as we look at considering others, there's a few things I want us to look at. Paul says if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, it's easier for us to consider others when we consider the relationship that we have with Christ. Uh, we don't have to be saved. You know, you don't earn salvation. Salvation is absolutely a gift. 
But God loved us enough that he gave us a savior, that if we choose him as our savior and walk in him uh, through faithfulness, then we are in a good situation. That's a that's a good thing. So Christ considered you and I when he was hanging up there on that cross. This is Paul's argument. If you understand that Christ considered you, consider others. Okay. If you have any comfort in his love, which is a good thing. If you have that comfort, understand why you have it. Because he chose you. Because he considered you. As he considered you, you should consider one another. Also, Paul, uh, after dealing with the relationship with the Christ, he also deals with the relationship with the Holy Spirit. He says, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, consider your relationship with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you and I, sanctifying us into the image of the Son, to the glory of God the Father. God the Father recognized that you and I would not be able to do this by ourselves, so he gave us as a down payment of our eternal salvation, the Holy Spirit, according to the Apostle Paul. And the Spirit guides us and it comforts us and it leads us, which is why we're not to quench it or grieve it or blaspheme him. Okay? Consider that relationship. Where would you and I be if the Holy Spirit wasn't guiding us? Okay? Bad place, bad place. Again, Paul is building an argument of considering one another. So uh, consider where you would be with or without Christ. Consider your relationship with the Spirit. And then Paul says to the Philippians, now consider your relationship with me. Uh, then make my joy complete, Paul says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. In other words, Paul is saying you and I are in the same place. We're thinking alike. We're on the same page. Uh, now, where would the Philippians be if there was not an apostle named Saul, Paul, who went around uh, walking, riding, floating from place to place? Okay, Gorman students, how many miles did you read about this week? 10,000. 10,000? What'd you say? A bunch. <laughs> I'm sure you was a mess in high school, Nikki. I, I, I'm just willing to believe that at this point. A bunch. <laughs> What's like X plus three equals one? A number. Uh, so Paul says, make my job complete. So consider your relationship with me. If you can consider your relationship with the Christ, and you consider your relationship with the Holy Spirit, consider your relationship with me. Make my joy complete. Here, the apostle has gone place to place, planting churches, preaching the gospel of Jesus. So Paul says, consider me, consider my humanity, consider the relationship that you have with me. And he does these things, consider others. Do not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I say again, in, in, tw in what year is this? In 2024 America, how far are we, or how far are we away from that? We're, we're taught only to consider the people who think like us. Only to consider people who vote like us. Only to consider the people who live in our neighborhood, who dress like we dress, who talk like we talk, who are far from a part of the world that we are a part of. None of that sounds like something Jesus would say. I have to consider myself and consider others. And think about this. I wouldn't have to consider a, a situation if it wasn't different from me. Birds of a feather flock together. So he is specifically talking about a situation where another person is different from you. This is a Gentile church. There were probably Jews around. Jews and Gentiles were told not to get along, especially on the Jewish side. But he's like, no, in Christ, you're one. There's no, this wall of partition, that law, that's not what we're living by anymore. Take the borders away. This is about Jesus Christ and him crucified, okay? And he makes this, this beautiful poem. And, and I know we're, we're, we're used to this poem. We have a video that actually a worship video, a communion video that talks about this, uh, God having exalted him uh, and given him a name greater than any other name that every name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. But he gives this poem for a reason. Verse number five, this is actually verse five. He says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. What was Christ's attitude? I'm gonna paraphrase it. Christ's attitude was, here I am. God in the flesh but I'm going to humble myself to be just like you so I can be what you need as a savior 
That's what Paul says. So if the Lord Jesus, who's God in the flesh, was willing to humble himself so he could be what you needed and what I needed, Paul says, his argument is, how should you act? If God was willing to humble himself so he could be what we needed, how much should I humble myself so I could be what you need? Uh, do you remember his words in 1 Corinthians 9? He became all things to all people that he might gain some. His agenda was the gospel. And whatever he had to do to preach the gospel, that's what he did. What the devil wants us to do is get mad at each other. Because guess what? I'm not going to witness to you if I hate you. I'm not going to witness to you if I'm arguing with you all the time. That's what the devil wants done. And we should see that as the Christian church. Like, I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm here to facilitate the mission of Jesus to Christ. I'm going to build a bridge between you and I so I can witness to you and help you come to know Jesus as Lord. That is Christianity one-on-one. -on -one. We have to consider others even as we go about this thing. Consider the ways of Jesus. Actually, I just, I just did that part. There's another couple of texts I want you to look at. Lord knows you might can't read them, so I'm going to... Don't, don't, don't strain, Nikki. I'm here. I'm going to bless you, sweetie. Uh, Romans 15, 1 through 13. If you're taking those in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 2. Uh, powerful text here, Romans 15, 1 through 13. Verse 1 and 2 says, We who are strong are the better and firm as the weak, and not please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good. And then he goes on. Verses uh, 2 through 13 is an exposition. He expounds on that. But the argument is, the strong bear the infirmities of the weak. Okay? And in Galatians 6, bear one another's burdens. And this fulfills the law of Christ. Do you see a common theme here? This ain't about you. <laughs> this is about the body of Christ. This is not about me. It's about we. It's about us. We don't do anything to cause dissension. Now, somebody might do it to us. Somebody might say you're my enemy. Somebody might say I don't want anything to do with you. And there's nothing we can do about that. But what we're not going to do is say I don't want anything to do with you. You're beneath me. I don't want to talk to you. You don't belong here. Foolishness. We're here to preach the gospel. We're going to consider others. Specifically so we can help them come to know Jesus as Lord. That's the mission of the church. That's the mission of the church. Okay. Let's look at Gorman. Uh, you had, I think, questions one, two, three, and six. Question one, what is the meaning and importance of the claims that open the chapter? Uh, what Gorman says, Paul was born a Jew, lived a Jew, died a Jew. It was therefore obviously as a Jew that he experienced the once crucified Jesus as the resurrected and exalted Lord. Paul did not send out, set out, thank you, uh, to found a new religion, blah, 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 blah. The focus being, what's important about this? Why is it important? What is significant? Uh, hopefully y'all read these questions before now. Some of you look lost just a little bit. Okay. So he was, he was a Jew, lived a Jew, died a Jew. Why is that important? Because that's who he was. That was, that was his foundation of his belief system. You know, mm -hmm. That's the way he looked at the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way he was brought up. Um, and I like that last part. Paul didn't set out to found a new religion. He, he set out to live out its fulfillment in Christ. Um, so he was a Jew, but when he met the Christ, he said, okay, that's what this all meant. You know, all these traditions, these, these uh, holidays, it all led and pointed to Christ. And so he was able to truly live it out. Um, but he wouldn't have been able to do it if his foundation wasn't living as a Jew um, the way he did and it was instilled in him. Good. I was gonna say, I think it's important, especially because in that time, although they were all, what would you call it, Hellenized, mm -hmm. you still had those principles of, I guess going back to Shema, in all of this, just principles of being. Look at them words, oh, I see. <laughs> it's Shema, but we'll go with Shema. <laughs> Shema. <laughs> and Torah, but, um, yeah, just all the, the, the classic foundation of, I, would, I wouldn't say a regular Jew, but just his Jewish ways before it was 
felt not she still stayed in that as he even before Christ but as he found Christ as well. Yeah. Granny, what are you gonna say? Well, just that with all of that Jewishness background kind of in life, he expected the Messiah to be the king. The Vedic. Of course, well, yeah. And so it took that whatever it was, that vision that he saw contact with Jesus himself to make him understand that yes, he was a Jew and you know all of that meant something, but Jesus could say and he needed to let the world know it. And I think it was easier in his position to let the world know that because he had all that Jewish background and Sadducee or Pharisee, whatever he was. Ooh, stop that. <laughs> You're going to upset the apostle spirit. The Sadducees. He's a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. Yeah. Sadducees yeah. don't believe in the resurrection. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> that, that's great. Uh, I, I like that because Israel was absolutely listen, uh, looking for a Messiah that was like David. Uh, they, he was going to march into Jerusalem, check up the Romans and put Jerusalem in this kingdom like David had. That's what they was looking for. Um, as I was reading this and, and just thinking about it, you know, here's a Jewish man, Pharisee, uh, trained by Gamaliel, very educated, training to be a rabbi, and he still missed this. Peter walked with Jesus three years in Acts chapter one. He's asking Jesus, hey, you finna restore to us the kingdom? He still missed it. This is after walking with him for three years. That should always keep us humble today as believers. Okay, how much Bible we read, we haven't mastered it. There's going to be always the opportunity to understand it a little bit better. Just like Paul. And he had Torah memorized. Believe that. If not all of it, good chunks of it. He didn't walk around with all these scrolls. When we see him writing, he just starts spitting. The, sorry. Uh, I'll try to stay preaching, not ghetto. Uh, <laughs> he just started writing uh, the Hebrew Bible. It was here. It was here. But his context needed a little help. So he's monotheistic. Here's Stephen. Here's a Jew. Here you are talking about Jesus as Lord. Gorman deals with this in this in this chapter, chapter two. So the Pharisees, especially, but the Jews holistically, they thought if you kept Torah, that would give the Messiah the reason to come here. So to see somebody like Stephen saying that this human being, Jesus is Lord, it goes against the monotheism. So to purge Israel in the spirit of uh, Matthias and uh, uh, what's the, the Old Testament Phineas, character? Phineas? Yes, Phineas. Thank you. Phineas. Phineas, uh, Phineas and, and Matthias. Hey, we're going to do some ethnic cleansing in the name of, of Yahweh. So, yes, Stephen, you got to die. Only to find out he was wrong. Mercy, Lord. Good. Number two, what is the historical and theological importance of understanding Paul's transformative experience as an appearance of Jesus, as a call and commission, as a conversion? Y'all wrestle with that however you want to. What are your answers there? Okay, Nikki. <laughs> Apple meat tree. Why is it important, Granny? I'm sorry, what? Why was it important? He couldn't. He couldn't have been the apostle that he ended up being without that. Mm, good. He just couldn't have. This wasn't in his makeup. Good. It, it reminds me of. Uh, the same that the kids say these days, like let them cook, let them cook. <laughs> and that's that's what God was doing with Paul. He was he was he was preparing him for this moment. He was like, okay, here's here's all the knowledge you're gonna need. Here's this, you know, you have uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, something. Uh, he, he had 
Zeal? Is that what you're talking about? Zeal, but like, you know, like, there's something precedes you, you're, you're... No, no, no. It's like when you meet somebody, like, oh, you're blank, blank, precedes you. You're, you're, uh... Reputation. Reputation. No. Yeah, he had a reputation. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, he was, he was, you know, under Gamilio, I mean, he was just like top-notch doing his thing. He had pedigree. Trying to, you know, try to Benjamin. And God knew what he was doing. He was cooking it up. And he was like, all right, now it's time. Now, you know, introduce Jesus. So I think that that was important for his theological stuff because he, like you said, he knew the Torah. And probably other book, other, you know, other than the five books, he probably knew some of the... Um, uh, he quoted the Apocrypha. He just yeah. never, he, never, he didn't... Anyway, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, no, I'm, yeah. Uh, so historically, it was important for him to know all this stuff. So when... When again, you know, Jesus Christ was revealed, and he was like, "Lord, Lord, you know, who are you, you Lord?" It was time because he he had already been prepared for all of this, and now he knew exactly what he was going to do with Paul. It was just up to Paul now to humble himself, call upon the name of the Lord, seek after Christ, and after that, you know, the, the whole going blind and, and then fulfilling the call, uh, the commission, because he was already being prepared. And now he just needed the conversion and then the, com the commission. So how does, what does that mean to you and I as it relates to this word here? Uh, once I come to know Jesus as Lord, accept Jesus as my Lord, shouldn't I have a transformation too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We talked, you, you kind of asked that question earlier a little bit. Uh, I verbalized the name of Jesus, but I don't transform him. That's not Christianity. Christianity is absolutely transformed. Paul didn't stop being a Jew, but his Jewishness um, was lived out through faithfulness to Christ. Still a Jew. I'm still an American. I'm still brown. I'm still male. Go true, ahead. I think he became a true Jew when he came to Christ because even like when Jesus said, From you know, faith, even, yes. Yeah. Faith was really transformed him, not the works. It was faith in Christ that, that began to transform Paul. Because um, before then, it wasn't faith. It was just works and, and, and zeal. And then when he met the risen Christ, it was my faith is in him now. All this is done. Now I see the scope of what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's when the, transform, the transformation comes in because of uh, the, co the, the conversion, the commission kind of meet each other. Because he was, he was, uh, he was on, he was on his way to destroy the church until he met Christ, and now everything that he learned and was taught is now going to fully come to display and be used by God. But again, God was just pre preparing Paul uh, or Saul to become Paul, to transform. Him. And all those things are are lifestyle scenarios, a call to ministry, you know. Uh, when Alberto asked you to be Mrs. Fuentes. Don't smirk, okay? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a lifestyle, you know. A call to follow Jesus is not a one hit a quitter, guys. It's a lifestyle of service. A commission, that's something we commit ourselves to. Commission is not one hit a quitter. It's a lifestyle. Transformation, lifestyle. Conversion, lifestyle. If once a caterpillar converts to a butterfly, true conversion, they don't become a caterpillar anymore. Conversion is a lifestyle of change. Not a perfect change, still human. But when we sin, what do we do? What's the word? Start with R, don't, don't. We repent. God, I messed that up. Thank you for being a God not of the second chance, but the God of another chance. We repent, we get up and we keep moving. We fall, we get back up, we keep moving. Moving toward Christ, moving in scripture. Getting better through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, day by day, process by process. Number three. Oh wait, uh -oh. can I ask another question? Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, it's okay, I just, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, there was like the- What's the matter? What you, what you, Trevino was doing over there? Oh, she had written her answers down over there. Oh, yeah, I have yours from, uh, that was the first one. okay, All right. I'm being nosy, go ahead. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, 
say Stevie, do me a favor. The put me theological up. importance of understanding Paul's reformation overall, or everyone would be to understand what true salvation is. Mm -hmm. And for the historical importance of it, it would definitely be, I would say for, what would you call it, the Judaizers, or the people that were stuck in Judaism, mm -hmm. they see that they were to follow Paul's example and understand, because back then, you know, they were in that time, so everyone understood the importance of, uh, what do you call it, mon mon monotheism. monotheism. So if they see that Paul, who's this just top of the top, can have this real experience with Jesus and eventually receive his salvation, then they can do the same as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like a two-part answer, I guess you could say. But overall, for everyone, it's definitely salvation. That's good. I think that's what Granny was getting at. Yeah. Uh, and that is important. I mean, again, in first century Judaism, people could argue that Peter, you're just a fisherman, you don't know much. They couldn't say that to Paul. <laughs> you know, Paul knew Torah, Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. And he, I mean, his own resume is like, hey, above my own brethren, considering the law blameless. You got a resume, I got one. Come get some. You know, and that man gave his life to Jesus Christ. So, absolutely. Go ahead, Paul. Chosen. Is that a question or a statement? I was actually asking you if that's what you think. If what? Is that what I think? Yeah, if that's why he um, continued to be a Jew, he didn't change at all that part of it, was because he knew that he was um, God's chosen people. Like God's chosen people. Technically, just the opposite. And what I mean by that is uh, the Judaizers went around telling the Gentiles that they had to keep the law of Moses to be saved. And Paul refuted them. Uh, we see this in Galatians, calling them fools. Uh, wherever you were, if you were a Jew or Gentile, Paul says, all that don't matter anymore. Uh, matter of fact, his argument is true Jews are not people who are in the bloodline of Abraham. True Jews are in the faith of Abraham. Yes, it goes back to faith in Christ. So yes, and no, you know, it, it's the lineage, but it's not the blood lineage, it's the faith lineage that makes you a Jew. Great question. What's the matter, Granny? You look at me funny. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about my study in Revelation right now. Point of out something to me that I had never realized before, and that's that the, the people that come to know Jesus during the call tribulation that they're not the bright they're not going to join us as being the bride of Christ they're separate they're they're waiting in in the heaven until all of them get there and until they can join the you know, we're going to be there as the bride. They're, I guess, coming as guests. The Jewish people, I, I don't know where or when I how, how they fit. I thought they're the bride of God. Is that, have you ever heard of that before? Yeah, they were the bride in the Hebrew Bible that continued to commit adultery, so we called them the whore. They were a whore's bride. Um, that gets deep because there's a question about, okay, does Christianity displace Judaism? Uh, which speaks to even Paul. Is he now leaving his Jewish roots and becoming Christian? Yeah, that's what I would you know. Yeah. You know uh, Paul and, and Peter and all of those guys, I 
are they Jews? And are they bride of God? Or are they Christians and the bride of Christ? The thing that gets at us, uh, Judaism is both a nationality and a religion. So Paul continued to be the national Jew, but his religion became faith in Christ. And in his own mind, he came to understand that that's what it was supposed to be anyway. It was moving to that direction. Now, when we bring John into the conversation, that's a whole nother class, Granny, can't get into it. Uh, <laughs> Right. You want to you want to go there? You want that smoke? Okay, I got books on them. <laughs> you want to do a revelation? Uh, but good stuff. And 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 when it comes to the apocalyptic nature of revelation, I encourage any believer walk gingerly through there because there are things that John wrote I don't get, and I don't mind telling you I don't get it. Uh, I've had conversations with professors. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, professor, but this is what I see. Hey, praise God, you see that. Uh, Jehovah's Witness say only 144,000 going to heaven. That's what they see. Lord knows they don't see well. But uh, what you're saying there, Revelation, how God brings that all together in, tr in the time of tribulation, what that looks like, totally whole different situation. But great question. But great. I, I have something here in Romans 11, kind of to what she's saying. Paul's talking about Israel's rejection is not mm -hmm. told. Uh, it says, I, I say then, has God cast away his people? You're going to mess it up, God. too. You're going to mess it up. But go ahead. For I am also an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of <laughs> Benjamin. Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Mm -hmm. Or do you not know what the scripture said of Elijah, how he pleased with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. Um, so I think that the Jews, they, you know, the true Jews, you know, and even in Romans it says that, you know, we're, we're the true Jews because we, uh, when you become a true Jew, it's a circumcision of the heart. Uh, so I, there are going to be Jewish bloodline in there with us when, sure. when we get called up. Sure. But the ones that are left behind are the ones that are, are still rejecting the Messiah. So there will be all a multicultural blend of people uh, from all over the world that are, will be up there at the marriage feast of the supper or the, the supper and those who are left behind Jew and non-Jew alike uh, like you said that it seems like they're going to kind of be guests or come in later um, and but I, I hopefully that, that kind of clarified it but they'll be there Peter and Paul you know people who were born in the lineage and then came to faith to be a true Jew, like Paul said, or yeah, Paul says, the circumcision of the heart. Uh, but then there's going to be the ones that are just like, no, I'm, I'm the lineage of Abraham. I, I reject this Messiah. I only worship Yahweh. And then when that tribulation happens, they're going to come to find out like, okay, maybe I was wrong. And then they come to faith, truly come to faith, searching the scriptures. Then we'll, we'll uh, they'll be up there or I guess that heaven and earth are going to come down. Christ is going to come down, create the whole new world. And so that's when we'll all kind of come together. No, Revelation was not even anything I asked y'all to read this week. Y'all do know that. I didn't even read Revelation. <laughs> it's an interesting conversation. It is. I, I'm open for it. I'm here for it all. Uh, if I may, I have permission to do three now. <laughs> How might Paul's understanding of apostleship inform and perhaps even correct contemporary notions of apostleship and ministry more generally? What do you mean by contemporary? Uh, contemporary means today. Oh. I like this one as a minister myself uh, because I I encourage people to walk carefully when it comes to the position that God gives us as pastors and, and ministers. Uh, Paul was an apostle, but he didn't go around using his apostleship in an authoritarian way. Uh, the only time he 
pleaded his case is when he needed to. Usually, in Paul's day, if you had a certain title, you let that you let it be known. I'm this, I'm that, and the other. Don't get me wrong, when he wrote his letters, he would say Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he does that to preface why they should listen to him as the Christian church. Out there in the world, he didn't go around, I'm an apostle of Jesus. I'm an apostle of Jesus. I'm all that. Bow down. <laughs> Sometimes preachers and pastors get full of themselves. And they misuse the bishopric, the office, the ministry. So, you know, I guess I've answered this question because of my office. Uh, we have to be careful and, 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 and react a certain way, carry ourselves a certain way. Jesus still proclaims the greatest among you shall be a what? A servant. So ministry is not about the minister. It's about the people that the minister is serving. That's ministry. This bow down stuff and I'm all this and I'm all that. That's not apostolic type ministry. Anybody else have anything on it? Yes, Granny. Oh, okay. So he tells the Corinthians. Come to serve. Yes. So we, we do well if we serve. That goes back to Philippians 2, right? So mm -hmm. if Jesus the Christ came to humble himself as a human being, then as a minister of Christ, how do I live my life? As a pastor of Christ, uh, Christ church, how do I live my life? How do I serve people? Do I expect to be served? Am I to be praised? No. Um, in the book of Acts, Peter and John are going to the temple, and Peter take the lame man raise him and they want to worship him like hold up calm, calm down mm -hmm. you know uh, Paul when he's talking to the Corinthians uh, the Corinthians those people had issues we need to pray for them and they're like hey I'm an Apollos Christian mm -hmm. you know I'm a Peter Christian hey I'm a Paul Christian Paul says what these are just people who preach the gospel there's no such thing as a Paul Christian or a Peter Christian you know just a Christian okay Last but not least, number six, what is the theological significance of the terminology when used to identify the ecclesia? Say that word there, Nikki G. Ecclesia. 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 Very good. <laughs> I just wanted you to say it. Ecclesia is the Greek word that we translate church. Uh, it was a very common word in the first century Judaism, or first century Rome, let me say that. Uh, it means church, it means association, it means body, it means community, it means all those things. So the question is, what's the theological significance of the terminology? What you got, Steve? That's how we're, that's what we're called, we're the body, we're, we're, we're uh, theologically, we're the church, we gather as the body, we're not a building, we're just a body. Um, like you were saying, and they when they used it in Rome, they would use it to like when they hold council meetings that are you know like hey we're going to go have church here to vote on what we're going to do in the community. Now the church is us individually going out and, and making other little churches, you know, other uh, living stones so we can be the church. So the church is kind of like the Jews from the old, you know, the diaspora. We're we're dispersed. Uh, as living stones, when we come together, we're, well, I think we're just much more greater we're all together, but we do our own thing <clears throat> as a church, so we don't have to be actually in a building to be the church. We are living stones outside of the church, or outside of the building. So, that, Anybody else want some of that? Good. Well, 
the thing that I love about this is, and you have to understand, culture teaches us a lot of stuff. There's a thing we say in our culture, going to church. That's bad theology. This is what we're understanding. You don't go to church. You are the church. You assemble at a building or a lease space or a house, you know? That's where you assemble. But the significance is this, if I can go to church, that means I can go away from church. So the mentality is I go to a building, I clock in, I do my religious thing, I hit that checkbox, then I leave and go back to being who I was before I went to church. No. Bad theology. I am a follower of Jesus everywhere I go. And Nikki G, you hit on this a little bit ago, I believe. I think it was you. Forgive me if it wasn't. But I represent Christ wherever I go. And don't get me wrong, depending on who you are to me, uh, I might be more deity than I am pastor. It depends on who you are to me. Uh, I make sure I don't offend you. So if you think that alcohol is a sin, well, if you're coming to my house, I'm going to hide all my alcohol. I, you know, because I don't want to do anything to stumble. Now, I've never purposely been drunk a day in my life, okay? Because the scripture says, don't be drunk with wine. But it doesn't say I can't drink it. Matter of fact, I have it in my office now. I'll show it to you next time you show up. <laughs> but you see what I'm getting at? You know, wherever I go, I represent him. So the church is not a building, it's the people. All right. Week number three, here are your assignments. Uh, in your syllabus, you'll see, uh, I'm sure Nikki F. loves this. You got to read both sources this week. But notice, Nikki G., it's only 26 or 27 pages of Gorman. I like that. But it's seven chapters of Acts. I like that too. Really? I made your approval. I, I would prefer to read the Acts than the Gorman. <laughs> well, a lot of times these have the pictures in them and it takes up a lot of space. Yeah. So when yeah. I do that, not. Oh, do not. Good. Not do good not. Page. There was one page where it had a big picture on each yeah. side. Yeah. I was like, yes. Oh, yeah. That was the pictures dealing with the uh, missionary journeys. Yeah. Missionary Journey 1, 2. I actually like that too. I mean, I have to do some reading. And when I have a long, like, yeah, this works. Uh, your discussion questions, the Q&A, is uh, questions 1, 2, 4, and 5. 1, 2, 4, and 5. If you want to write those down in your syllabus. That's what we'll talk about in class next week. 